our next uh, speaker's picture, in fact, could be found in the dictionary next to the word definition of self-made man. Did you know that? He has worked his way up in the same company that he leads today, in fact. Via his grit and determination, he has managed to establish not just his stature in Indian manufacturing, but also established Indian manufacturing's prowess across the globe. We're talking about none other than the dynamic MD and global CEO of Tata Steel, Mr. TV Narendran. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome him. He's going to be... Down the line, a uh, virtual conversation with ET Now and ET Now Swadesh's managing editor, Nikuj Dalmia. Good evening, everyone. They say that the sun is not going to be in the sun. But the steel cycle is not going Steel is shining like gold. If data is the new oil, steel is now considered to be the new gold. Steel companies are reporting profits like never before. The cycle is strong like never before. And it gives me once again great pleasure to take this conversation forward with Mr. Narendran. Uh, Mr. Narendran, I don't have steel here. I would have said touch steel instead of touch wood. But touch wood given what is happening to the steel prices. My question to you, sir, is is the uptrend in steel here to stay? Jo make phrase use karte hain, achhe din. Steel industry ke achhe din aage hain. But are they here to stay? So, Nikun, there are multiple things which are happening which is uh, impacting commodity prices. You know, first is the China story, right? Uh, China has been the driver of commodity prices uh, in different ways for more than the last couple of decades. And uh, while between 2000 and 2010, it drove demand and hence a higher priced commodity cycle between 2010 and 2020, it was uh, exporting a lot of commodities. It was also slowing down a bit, and hence the commodity prices uh, settled at a lower level. But I think we are back to a stage where China is exporting less. China continues to grow, maybe at a slower rate, but on a bigger base. Uh, and the more important thing which has happened in the last few years is uh, geopolitical events and how it can impact supply chains. And commodity supply chains normally are global supply chains. So we are very significantly impacted by what happens geopolitically. So whether it was the spat between China and Australia and its impact on coal prices from three, four years back, the pandemic and its impact on supply chains across the world, or more recently what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and its impact on commodity prices. So I think we are seeing a period of heightened commodity prices, more vulnerability to global geopolitical risks, and hence the volatility is much higher than you've seen in the past on a base which is much higher than we've seen in the past. So that's, I think, going to be uh, the way we're going to see the next few years. Right. So it's good to hear that, sir, that steel cycle is back and the Achhe Din are here to stay. But let's look at uh, the global scenario. You know, while with ITC and with TCS, we looked at local scenario. It's important to understand the global scenario. After all, steel is a global commodity. There are two large moving parts here, Russia, which currently has the most comparative steel manufacturing capacity is not going to be exporting. And China, which was exporting, is now looking at restricting the steel exports because of restrictive factor. So more than domestic Indian demand, is this right now an excellent time, an excellent cycle for steel exporters like Tata Steel? Possibly, yes, uh, Nikunj, and for good reasons. Because, you know, China has not really been a great place to produce steel because they import most of their raw materials. They were selling steel cheap, but they were not competitive. The Chinese steel producers, from a cost competitiveness point of view, were worse than the Indians and the Russians, right? So while they were selling steel cheap, if you look at the profitability of the Chinese steel industry, it is nothing uh, compared to what it should be for capital-intensive industries like steel. What is happening in China is because they are now also focused on climate change, want to move towards net zero. They are seeing less and less value in importing raw materials and exporting steel and leaving a carbon footprint behind. So they're largely controlling their steel industry so that they produce the steel that they need to use and not really producing steel for the world and leaving a carbon footprint behind in China. So that's changed the dynamic in China. Russia is different. Russia, like India, has raw materials, but India has a larger market than Russia has. So while Russia needs to depend on imports uh, to build uh, on exports to build scale, Indian steel producers can invest to build scale for the domestic market and export uh, whatever they need to export rather than 
have exports as the only way to build scale. So that's a big difference, and that's why India has the advantage uh, uh, of having raw materials like Russia, but having a large domestic market uh, like China and a growing domestic market. So I think the Indian steel industry is well positioned to continue to grow. Uh, India has uh, every reason to be a big exporter of steel. If you look at the big exporters of steel in the world, it's Russia, which has raw materials, but otherwise it is China, which has no raw materials, Japan, which has no raw materials, Korea, which has no raw materials. No reason why India, with all the raw materials that we have, should not be a, a obviously a self-sufficient steel producer, but also a big exporter of steel. Okay, I, I am completely with you that things are looking good. But good news comes along with bad news. And there is a big change in the way how raw material prices have moved. Now, with the exception of sale, that steel authority, none of the Indian steel companies in India are fully integrated, which is they don't have access to iron ore and coal. Coal prices have been notoriously high. What is the hedge for you? How are you managing it? That's true, Nikunj, uh, because the coal uh, in India is more thermal coal than coking coal, which is what is required for steel making. Uh, so the quality of coals in India are not as great as it should be. So India will always need to import coal. But firstly, we need to better use the coal that is available in India. And I think there is some coking coal which is available in India, which also sometimes end up ends up in power plants. So there is a need for us to look at how can we get more value out of the coal resource that we have. But having said that, India will continue to be a big import, importer of coking coal. India is already importing about 50, 60 million tons of coking coal per year. And that will keep growing as the steel production grows. And largely, it uh, is coming from Australia. Some of it used to come from Russia and some of it comes from Africa. So that's why the recent trade agreement between India and Australia is also very important. Uh, because uh, for Australia, India is going to be the biggest importer of coking coal. For India, Australia is going to be the biggest source of coking coal. So we need to look at how can we drive uh, uh, more value out of this relationship. Uh, we've been talking to the Australian government about uh, improving the infrastructure in Australia because uh, uh, they are also bottlenecked at times. And secondly, how can the Australian coal suppliers set up facilities in India for blending and supplying, uh, uh, you know, uh, from stock points that they have in India rather than Indian steel companies having to hold 50, 60 days of stock because they have to import from Australia. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in this area and the strategic relationship between India and Australia needs to be leveraged because coking coal imports is going to be one of the biggest imports for India going forward as the steel industry goes. Okay. Um, Mr. Narendran, this is just for the benefit of the attendees here and also for those who perhaps do not track the steel cycle that aggressively or that closely. Historically, steel has always followed a 8 to 10 year cycle, which is that when a cycle starts, whether it is uptick or a downtick, it lasts for 8 to 10 years. Do you think this cycle also will last minimum for 8 to 10 years? So, Nikuj, I think uh, there are multiple reasons why things are different. One is uh, governments across the world are investing in infrastructure, right, which has not happened for a long time. Earlier, it was either China investing in infrastructure. Even before that, it was uh, Europe and US and Japan and Korea, etc. Now you have uh, governments across the world investing in infrastructure because that's a good way to bring, bring the economy back on rail. Of course, uh, there is a concern that growing inflation and fiscal deficits may uh, uh, kind of mellow some of those ambitions. But having said that, across the board, whether it's the US, whether it's Europe, there's investment in infrastructure, not only regular infrastructure, there's a lot of green infrastructure being built in terms of transitioning to a green economy, the infrastructure that's required for that. So on the demand side, we see the demand strong outside of China. Uh, in fact, for the last couple of years, the growth in steel consumption outside China has been more than the growth in steel consumption in China. And during this decade, you will see the steel consumption outside China to be bigger on an absolute basis than the consumption in China. And that's a big shift for the steel industry because at its peak, China was accounting for about 65% of the steel consumption. Today, it's down to 57. It will go down to less than 15 than during this decade. So that's a demand side story. On the supply side, a lot of the capacity that was added in the steel industry over the last two decades has been in China. And China is no longer adding uh, capacity. And no other country in the world can add as much capacity as fast as China did. So even if you look at India, it takes a long time to build a greenfield site. You can expand through your existing sites, but starting a new site takes time. So I don't see the supply side capacities being added as rapidly as it was the last time when commodity prices were high. And then third is, of course, like I said, China is no longer a spoiler as far as global trade is concerned. 
So you will have a better balance of demand and supply than we've seen in the past. So in my view, the commodity prices, at least for the industry that I represent, will continue to stay on the higher side. I'm not saying today's steel prices will be here to stay, but over this decade, you will see higher steel prices than you've seen in the last decade for sure. Amit Narendran, steel prices, the way they move, it will have impact on steel stocks. Tata steel stock has gone up from 300 rupees to 1500 rupees. The minute I say that, I will get everyone's attention towards me. Then Dikunj will try and understand where the Tata steel stock is headed. No, I'm not going to get into style Tata steel stock. But what I want to understand from you, Mr. Narendran, is if I say that steel prices, given what your view of the world is, are unlikely to fall more than 10%, thus percent se other steel stock, steel may mandi nahi aayegi. Will I be right? Yeah, 10, 15 percent, it will be volatile, but across a higher base. You know, Nikunj, if you really look at uh, 25, 30 years back, we've seen 180 dollars for hot roll pile prices, right? Uh, between 2000 and 2010, it was closer to 550 dollars, 600 dollars. Between 2010 and 2020, it was closer to 400 dollars. I think you're going to see steel prices or hot roll coil prices, which is uh, surrogate benchmark and that 650 to 750 dollar range or higher, you know. So that's the range. May not be a thousand and twelve hundred that you see off and on. It will be volatile. It will go up and down depending on geopolitical issues. But on an average, it will be much higher than we've seen in the last decade. That's for sure. That's why. That's why I meant. So it will be maybe ten, fifteen percent lower than where it is today. But it will be volatile and, like I said, fluctuate on a higher base. So I've got a sense on steel cycle where the long term prospects are, medium term prospects are. I'm just going to wrap it up with one final question. Europe, there is a crisis. There is availability, non-availability of gas. You got plants in Europe. You got chorus there. You got a uh, lot of other plants in Netherlands. How are you prepared to deal with this energy shock in Europe? And what happens to Europe as a region in terms of steel capacity? So Europe is having a challenge because Europe was uh, wanting to transition from coal to hydrogen via gas. You know, so generally the transition plans of the European steel industry was more about substituting coal with gas and then gas with hydrogen. But given the issues with Russia, which was the source of a lot of the gas for Europe, they're looking at alternate sources. It could be LNG from the Middle East or elsewhere. Also an accelerated transition to hydrogen. Right. So Europe is rethinking its plans uh, and that has an impact on the transition plan of the steel industry. European demand is also picked up and it's back to where it was uh, pre-2008. That was one geography where the steel demand never caught up with the 2008 demand uh, you know, for the last 10, 12 years. But now it's caught up with that. And like I said, a lot of investment in infrastructure uh, in the transition to the green economy uh, going forward, based on what I've heard in the last two, three months, uh, more in spending on defense. All this is going to, uh, again, uh, certainly make the demand healthier than it was in the last 10, 15 years. There are supply chain issues, auto industry is struggling a bit because of semiconductor, etc. But largely, we are seeing demand to be reasonable by European standards. And, uh, of course, the European uh, regulatory uh, mechanism is also trying to put in carbon border adjustment mechanism so that the steel industry, when they're investing to transition to a greener future, is secure that uh, more carbon inefficient steel doesn't come into uh, Europe at lower prices. So that's what is happening in Europe. And everyone is basically working with the governments to, uh, you know, uh, fine tune or rather define this transition plan, which is viable. Mr. Narendra, I know we managed to, you know, uh, convince you to join in between uh, a packed day. So really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. I just want to wrap this discussion with my opening point, which is that nothing can replace gold demand in India. But given how steel prices and steel profitability are going to be there, I guess for investors, it really makes sense to buy steel stocks and not invest in gold. It makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll give it back to Aisha.